Hello everyone, my name is Chris Lamont and welcome to NYO Canada Online Workshops. Our YouTube live chat is open and we will be fielding questions throughout the workshop, so please feel free to post any comments, questions, and chat amongst each other. Today's presenter is not only an NYO alum, a devoted teacher, and horn player for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, but a truly dedicated and inspirational musician. Please welcome Gabe Radford. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Chris. It's really cool to be here. I, I don't know, it's been 10 years or so. I've been a faculty member at NYO, and this is a first, for sure, talking to my webcam on a beautiful sunny day in the spring, not the summer. Thanks for joining me. I mean, I, I'd say this is super cool in the way that NYO is super cool. We got a lot of people here tuning in because you are interested. And if there's anything I've noticed from fellow teachers, uh, whether that be high school teachers or uh, music teachers like me, um, it's getting people to engage in a forum like this has been very difficult. There's something very specific about what we're all going through right now that makes us wanna be inward and be insular. And so it's really cool that you are using this time and using NYO to be part of your creative process as we go through this. And so what I wanted to offer you in this time, you know, I'm a, I'm a musician like you guys. I'm not a clinician, I'm not a, I don't have a spiel, I'm just a horn player. But, uh, so I feel like I, I'm sharing many of the experiences that you're sharing. I've got my instrument, I've got my work to do, and yet I have no concerts. So why practice? What is the point of practicing when there are no concerts to practice for? So I just wanted to kind of have this opportunity to share with you what my thoughts on are. You know, I've been seeing my students regularly um, and seeing what they're going through. I have a feeling that many of you are going through the same thing. So um, I thought a good way to start would be with a, with a phrase I heard recently um, that is, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is now. And when I heard that on one of these podcasts I, I listened to while, watching the, while walking the dog, I thought, Yep, that's right. You know, we can we can choose to have regret for what has passed already, or we can say, all right, what is going to change right now? And what I want to reassure you of is that your COVID-19 story has not yet been written. Um, no matter how you feel like you spent in the last two months, it's not it's not the story. You got, what you have to realize, maybe it's easier in my age than it is your age to realize is how momentous this thing is that has happened. Um, for every generation alive today, this is the biggest deal. The only thing that could rival it is maybe World War II. And the really unusual thing about this situation is that something like you know JFK being assassinated or September 11th is that those you know those things happen right away. Those have, things happen quickly. They were a huge shock to the whole world. But then life kind of went on after a week or so, and here we are in this situation, and uh, everything's shut down and especially performing arts. You know, of all the things that, that are getting a lot of press for being shut down, I feel like us artists are not, we aren't in the forefront of people that can't, you can't do what we do. I have to say that a lot of my colleagues and certainly me, I felt kind of useless. I, my, actually teaching has been good for me uh, mentally because I can still help. But as a horn player, I can't really help that much. I mean, I can go on the street and, and play for people to thank frontline care workers like some of my colleagues are. But beyond that, really what I do is not a useful thing at this time. So the question that I wanna answer or help you answer today is why, why are we practicing? So I just wanna give you an idea of how, how, how global this shared feeling is. I'm not sure if any of you who uh, have checked out Alan Gilbert's Facebook page. Alan Gilbert is a, was the music director of the New York Philharmonic, and now he's got an orchestra in Sweden. And he ran, he's run two conversations with eminent conductors so far. And they're both excellent, I highly recommend them. Check them out on Facebook, Alan Gilbert. So in the first one, he's talking with, among others, uh, Simon Rattle. Simon Rattle, longtime music director of the Berlin Phil and now with London Symphony. I mean, Simon Rattle is like the smartest guy you'll ever meet. And Alan Gilbert said, you know, what scores have you been studying? What have you been doing? And Simon Rattle was like, actually, you know, a lot of cooking, uh, looking after my kids, and that's kind of it. And in the second uh, interview, which was another group of four conductors, um, he was interviewing the other guy that I think is the smartest person in our business. His name's Essa Pekka Salonen, and he was longtime music director of the LA Phil. Um, took some time away from uh, music directing to become a uh, 
back to being, I mean, he's always been a composer, but to focus on composing. And now he's going to start up with the San Francisco Symphony. And and again, Alan Gilbert said, you know, this must be the greatest time for you as a composer. This must be normal. He said, actually, actually it's not normal. He, he kind of stuttered a little bit. He's finished. And, and he said, uh, the truth is, this has not been a productive time for me. So if you have feel, been feeling like you have not been getting a lot done, the best in the world, share your concerns. So I get into trouble when I try to start defining things, but it's how I, it's almost like a mental model for me. So I like to think about these things. And in this time, I'm thinking, well, how am I going to look back? What am I going to say about what I did? And within that, what is wise action and what does discipline mean? And so for me, the word wisdom, I had to figure out, well, what does wisdom mean? For me, it means intelligence and intelligent action plus time. Okay, wisdom doesn't happen right away. It's something that has time involved. And what is discipline? I've decided that discipline for me is what my future self wishes I had done in that moment. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I feel bad for not running 10K in that moment. Sometimes, sometimes my future selves wish I had relaxed more, had spent more time sitting on a couch and doing nothing. So discipline doesn't mean maybe what you think it might mean. In, to me, sometimes it takes discipline to not do, and we will definitely talk about that today. Some of you may know I've suffered a playing injury the past little while, uh, been difficult at, uh, dealing with some chop stuff, and it's funny how this time for me has allowed me to take time away from the instrument, that I didn't have the, and this is an important word here, I didn't have the courage to take time off. And so some of you, depending on where you are in your studies, you might be thinking, oh, I can't take time off right now. No, 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 I can't take time off. I'm just going to keep on slugging. But maybe when you're keeping on slugging, you're reinforcing kind of a, a treadmill kind of way of playing where you're just trying to get it done. And maybe that's actually not the kind of player you want to be. Maybe that's not reflecting good discipline. Maybe the discipline that you need is to put the instrument down for a week, for two weeks, for a month. I don't know. It depends on what you need. So for me, taking the time off has allowed me the separation from the instrument to consider my predicament, to consider what I need to do. And now I'm coming back to the instrument and in so much better form. So maybe that will resonate with you guys as well. You need to release yourself from any fact of what you've been doing. Like, let's, let's forget about it. This is planting a tree right now. What are we going to build on? So what actions? For me, reflect right now what I need to do in terms of wisdom and discipline. And, and these ones, I can't say strongly enough. I know I'm just a horn player and I'm a bit outside my lane here, but listen carefully. Eat well, move your body, sleep. Okay? Eat well, move your body, and sleep. The other one I'll add to this situation is reach out. So it may feel like being insular is natural in this situation during this pandemic, but I encourage you to reach outwards to your network. Just send a message to somebody that you never had time to send a message to before, okay? Eating well, sleeping, and moving your body are as important or more important than they have ever been. I will say, however, on top of that, if that is your, as I like to say, most of the time, most of the time you're doing those things. Again, I'll say it again. Eat well, sleep, and move your body. And then some of the times, eat crap. Stay up all night and lock yourself in a dark room and watch Netflix. Okay. Sometimes that's part of health. Sometimes we can overwhelm ourselves with these thoughts of things we need to be doing that we're not doing. But generally, I think if you have a choice to go for a walk around the block, to go to bed a little earlier, and to avoid the bag of chips at night, I think that's going to help you mentally and in terms of your play. So as I said, my feeling on practicing is that taking time is a very important time part of your practicing life. So whether that's a day a week or whether that's taking a month off now or whether that's finding a couple of weeks in the summer, even when you are training for a job, like, you know, hoping to win an audition in the next year, you're like, I cannot possibly take time off. The shortest path to your success may be, in fact, taking time off. And I really encourage you to think about that. And the thing about taking time off is it gives you time to plan, to plan First of all, what kind of player you want to be and what kind of practicing it's going to be to become that kind of player. So 
in this pandemic situation, I want you to ask yourself, what kind of opportunities does this represent? So I don't know about your school, but where I teach at U of T in particular, and to a certain extent at Glenn Gould School, you you know, you've got a practice room and you've got it for your 30, 60, or 90 minutes. And when you're done, you know, you go for a drink of water and somebody's knocking on that door because they want to take that practice room away from you. So we are forced into this habit of a practice session is an hour or longer. And I actually think that's destructive. I don't think that rep represents how the brain works. And I have been trying to teach my students to get away from this idea that a practice session is an hour or more. And so I have a feeling you're all practicing in, at home. So what happens if you were to say, okay, well, what is my ideal practice session? How long is that ideal session? That's gonna be different for different people. Uh, if you're like me and you have a short attention span, that may be a 20 minute session is, is what you need. I mean, the brass players that I'm speaking to today, you know, we need a certain amount of strength in order to be rewarding on our instrument. The woodwind players I'm speaking to today, you know, you have to have a read, otherwise playing feels like crap. So I, I understand that there's a certain amount of work you have to put in in order to have your level. I'm sure there are you know, equivalencies in other instruments, I just don't know them as well. So um, if you take, take away this idea of the one hour practice session and you say, okay, I'm gonna move my practice session into smaller chunks of say 20 minutes, I find it to be a tremendous opportunity in terms of my productivity. So for instance, if you were to practice for 20 minutes and then let your brain rest for 10 minutes, I mean, the teacher in me says that you should get outside and go for a walk around the block, but the realist in me says you can disappear into your phone for 10 minutes. Like I really think that that is a way, the reason why we crave it so much is because our brain wants to shut off. And so if you allow your brain to shut off, it's more of an opportunity for your brain to then focus when it's time to practice. So now we're gonna to get to the, to the meat of what I wanna to talk to you today about. What's the content of the practice session and what has worked for me and my students in terms of the structure of that practice room? So I'll start with a quote from my wife. Those of you that are my students are gonna be used to me quoting Sarah Jeffrey. She's principal oboe of the TSO and uh, a big influence on me and my playing. And she said to me at one point a couple of years ago, all we have are our standards. And I thought, wow, that's, that's gonna hit hard and that's gonna make me think a lot. And it has made me think a lot. You know, I want you to use this time and to keep, and I, Jeff spoke a little bit about this. Why are you practicing? Are you practicing just because you had a jury coming up? Are you practicing because somebody has created this construct of a, a grading scheme, which is crazy? Are you practicing because someone told you to give a recital or did you really wanna give that recital? So we need to find motivation from within. We need to find a reason to practice in order for those practice sessions and the, the practice room to be a productive space. If you find yourself lacking inspiration, if you find yourself not figuring out why you're practicing, that's a moment to put the instrument down and say, okay, I'm gonna take the rest of the day off to just kind of think about why I practice my instrument. Why am I a flute player? Why am I a violinist? What do I have to say? What is it about music that has drawn me there? I'll talk a little bit after I talk about practicing about the, you know, the context of what we're all doing. But suffice it to say, I think it's important. Um, I think it's necessary. And so, but what I don't think is important or necessary is practicing like crap and not caring about the quality of your sound and also practicing on an arc of achievement that's heading you to below your potential. You know, we, are, we all have this, these kind of arcs around us about, about how good we can get given our talents and given our bodies. And we should all be chasing that the steepest arc we possibly can so that we can get to the level that we really feel like we can be great artists. And, and I mean, really what we're going for is how can we communicate to the audience in the way that we actually really want to? Because if you have avoided uh, woodwind players, you're single-tonguing, or brass players too, you're single-tonguing and then you get to a passage that of a, of a concerto and you can't play it because your single tongue sucks, well then you haven't practiced on your arc so that your performance is gonna be such that you can actually say what you want to musically. So uh, those of you that check Slack uh, will 
we see that I that I said, you know, is this how you practice? So believe me, I am familiar with this kind of practicing. I need to practice to keep my chops in shape. I better go practice. I put it off for 10 minutes. I take the garbage out. I figure out all these things to do. I'm like, fine, okay, now I'm really gonna practice. I close the door, I pick up my horn. <sighs> all right, what now? Da, 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 da. You know, and I'll, I'll just, I'll noodle. I'll just make it up on the spot. And they'll be like, oh, let me try this exercise. Oh, now I'll try that exercise. And in the end, I feel like if someone were to give me a scorecard at the end of that practice session, I wouldn't have achieved anything except for time on my instrument. And the only time that that is useful is like just getting the blood flowing, you know, just getting the, getting the arm moving or staying in quote unquote shape. But I, I don't even think it does a good job at that. So I just have a quote that I want to read you. Um, those of you that have not read the talent code should read the talent code. Those of you that don't like reading at all, should read The Little Book of Talent, uh, which uh, Daniel Coyne, the author, decided, I think that, or maybe his publisher decided that we, he needed an even shorter version. The talent code is, like, I know, I know how long it takes to read the talent code because I read it from uh, the tarmac in Toronto Pearson to the tarmac in Calgary when I went to go teach at Banff. I read it in the, in the how long it takes to fly from Toronto to Calgary. So it's not a long book. It's worth your time. It's a great insight into practicing. And then a few years later, as I say, he came up with a little book of talent, which is basically one page. In fact, they don't even fill the pages of this tiny book of little meditations on practicing. It's, it's really worth your time. So I'm going to read a little bit from him. Each time we deeply practice, we are slowly installing broadband in our circuitry. We are firing a signal. Struggle is not optional. It is neurologically required. In order to get your cir skill circuit to fire optimally, you must, by definition, fire the circuit suboptimally. You must make mistakes and pay attention to those mistakes. You must slowly teach your circuit. You must also keep firing that circuit, i.e. practicing. After all, myelin is a living tissue. Now you can read all about myelin. I, I won't get into the brain science stuff. He really puts it very succinctly in one sentence. He says, when you depart the deep practice zone, you might as well quit. Now quit's a strong word, but I get it. I get it. I had a major leap forward in my practicing when I forced myself to put down my horn every time I felt like I really left, like when I was thinking about something completely different. Try that with yourself and you will be discouraged, but don't worry. You won't believe how much quicker you find focus in your playing. And I'll get to timers, which is, which is the way that even my crazy brain can slow down and practice. So this notion of, of developing myelin is a physical reaction to doing something over and over again. So my question is, what are you repeating for your brain that's developing this substance in your brain? Are you developing a habit of using poor posture or taking a bad breath or having issues with your bow arm? Are, you, are those things that you are doing that you are building a habit on or are you taking a step back and realizing where the issue is and fixing it slowly and patiently? The truth is I say slowly and patiently, but once you start paying attention, in those words, I actually underline paying attention for myself because I want you to understand that, that the job number one is to pay attention. What I've noticed, you know, I'm, I'll tell, I was gonna say I noticed in my students, but actually I have a story about me where this, this was like, I, I call it the cold bucket of ice water in my face. Um, I was a pretty good horn player in the Toronto Symphony uh, for five years, uh, doing pretty well, I would say, and uh, we had a new principal horn join us, Neil Deland. And uh, he would play and I thought, wow, beautiful sound, amazing uh, rhythm, uh, unbelievably great character. And then after about a year, I thought, but there's more, there's something else that's better, something else that he does better than me. And I realized it when he was doing one of his warm ups, he does a kind of interval warm up. And I noticed that all of his fourths were perfect and his fifths were perfect and his octaves were perfect. And what I noticed was that I had a habitual way of stretching those intervals. So that each one of those instruments, particularly fourth, fifths, and octaves, were just a little wide. And what had happened was I had developed this ear that heard a wide octave. And so it no longer sounded out of tune to me. 
Now, if some of you have a little shudder of fear going down your spine, <laughs> good. Because what happens to us is we hear our own intonation. We hear it and we're so accustomed to it that we no longer hear it anymore. And somebody's like, huh, you're playing sharp there. And you're like, well, I have a pretty good ear and I don't think I am. You can both have a good ear and play out of tune. What does this mean? It means that you need a way in your practice room of retraining your ear. The truth is it's not scary. You just have to do it. If you never do it, it'll never get better. But if you actually take the time to pay attention, you can relearn something remarkably quickly. So I ask you, what is that in your playing? What about your playing doesn't meet the rest of it? Like if you have jagged edges in your ability or do you have a, an amazing high sound and a crappy low sound? Can you play fast really well and do you play slow not very well? It's usually the other way around. Do you play slow really beautifully? Are you the person that, that everyone wants to hear a Brahms melody? But when it comes to like a Mozart last movement, are you do you kind of fall short? What skills exactly do you need to flatten those, you know, get that one up to meet the other one? That's what we're really talking about today, is to get our playing to the highest level possible in an even way, because that's what you can hear in someone's playing. When it's so good, you have to go, oh yeah, each, each part is there. So I have an exercise for you, and, and um, it's an important one. I, I feel like it's been an important one for me. So. I think you should start with your own instrument um, and listen to the really the best of the best. You know, who is the best musician on your instrument? The best musician and player, you know, sometimes they're different, but go for the best musician and player and say, what is it about their playing that I lack in my playing? And you might be like, well, where do I begin? Okay, where do you begin? Let's, let's start absolutely simply. I can't play that note, <laughs> okay? If you can't play that note, exactly what is getting in your way? Do you have an issue with tension? Do you have uh, a technical issue that you have been ignoring? Talk to your teacher about it. Why can't I play that note? I can't play, let's say, a descending arpege arpeggiated feature. I know that I can't play that in tune. Exactly why not? Exactly what skill are you missing? Write it down on a piece of paper. Write it down on the note file on your phone. There's something very powerful about enumerating that and putting it on a list and saying, this is exactly what I need to work on. I have a scorecard um, that I did for myself and for my students. I don't sure how applicable it would be to a percussionist or, or, a, or a cellist, but I'll provide it for you guys as well afterwards. Just a little scorecard to say, can I do the following things? And what, how do I rank it out of 10? I think that that's a great little example of, of self-evaluation that you have time to take care of right now. When you're preparing for a jury or a recital, you don't have time for self-evaluation. You just got to get her done. You have to figure out ways of working around your technique. Right now is the time. Let me be clear. Right now is the time to take care of those problems because you don't have a concert coming up for the first time maybe ever. So... So take a step back and say exactly what is the difference between my playing and the best people in the world, and you'll start to develop a bit of a practice plan. I had, uh, you know, I've been to many, many master classes. I help run the master class, class program of the Glenn Gould School, and so we've had a lot of guests, and I've heard a lot of master classes. One of my favorites was uh, by a gentleman named Tom Hooten, who's the principal trumpet of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and he has a very simple graph. It's just a spreadsheet graph, and what he's got is uh, each skill uh, written down the left side of the page, and then he's got a day. And if he does something for five minutes, it gets one slash in the box. If he's done it for 10 minutes, he gets another one. 15 minutes, it goes around the whole box, and then he colors it in if he's done it for 20 minutes. So let's let's call it uh, spiccato, or let's call it single time. And you spend five minutes of work on it, 10, you see what I'm saying. And so you get this graphical representation of a month that shows you that it's been an entire 30 days since you've worked on your long tones. This is the kind of way that you can figure out where you're, what you're missing in your practicing. So what's worked for me and what's worked for my students is this notion of three sessions to the day. Now, given the COVID-19 structure, I've altered it slightly. I would say that you have three options for your practicing and I welcome uh, more uh, and criticism, but for me, there are three options. One are skills. You're either sitting down in your chair or standing at your stand to work on your skills, 
or you're working on specific musical challenges, technical problems within the course of a piece or an etude or a, or a scale, and finally, performing. I believe that performing takes practice. I'll get to each one of those. So this kind of graph and the ranking of skills, I would say that that is a session one, and, and it doesn't have to happen in this order during the day. But let's let's have the three sessions. Session one would be the skill. So so the various aspects of work that are required daily, that you're playing that take require daily work. I think those are um, easily addressed with a timer. I'll get to that again. Um, and they should be cycling through in a given period of time, call it a month. In any given month, you need to work on each aspect of your skills so that you're a complete player. Session two technique. So uh, again, I'm going to send out something to you guys after this. I haven't made it yet, so be patient. But I feel like um, if you're given a lick in a piece, it doesn't matter what instrument you play, um, what I have found are that three different practice techniques are the ones that have solved the problems for me. Number one, I call old school, which is slow to fast. Uh, no offense to those that, that do slow to fast. I think it's an amazing way to practice. But Again, this is like, I get in trouble for stuff like this, but I think it's really limited. I don't know about you guys, but for me, I've noticed that when I go slow to fast, no matter how slow I start and no matter how patient I am, there's always a number that I hit to get to that I, I just can't go beyond it. So if I'm going for 132, even if I start at 76, it'll be at like 116 every single time that I have a problem. And then what? So absolutely slow to fast is a key to practicing. I am not poo-pooing slow to fast. Don't tell your teachers I said that. It's great, but I find that that is the step one of getting through technique. The other ones have really changed my technique. Um, so uh, the pivot, I call it the pivot, which is where you give your brain a moment in the middle of a dif difficult technical passage. So let's say you have a, a run of eight sixteenth notes. In between four sixteenth notes and four sixteenth notes, you throw a quarter note rest. Ba 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 ba. Just like that. If the lick is ba 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 ba, you go ba 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 ba. Okay, that's the beginning. Now, the key to pivot is that you can do it on every any note you want. So let's say you want to do the pivot after two sixteenth notes, you'd go ba 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 ba. Okay, and that was just an eighth note rest. But you get the idea. You can add a quarter note if that's what your brain needs. Basically, what you're looking for is is the point in the passage where your brain kind of frazzes out. I don't know if you guys know this feeling, but for me, when I hit a technical lick and my, it's more than my brain can take, I get this kind of feeling where I just, I take my hands off the wheel and hope. And so it's that moment where you want to add a pivot. Okay. So, so a chord note rest in that, in that, uh, that lick. And then gradually, that's when you have to turn the metronome off and gradually reduce that chord note rest until it's just audible to only you. So for a while it'll be like ba 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 and then after say three minutes it's ba 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 and then after five minutes it might be ba 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 but in your head there's a little pivot there where you have a moment for your brain to go in a different direction. Okay the last one I call add a note and this is the one that changed my life. This is uh this Gord Wolf sent me a YouTube video maybe I'll, I'll try to find it. But you don't really need it. It's a pretty simple concept. Maybe five or six year or seven years ago, um, I got introduced to Adenote, and it's as it sounds. You put you put the lick on at the tempo, at the tempo you want it to be at, and you play one note. And then when you have, when your brain is completely comfortable with one note, bop, you play two notes, and you only add a note until you uh, when you have gotten the lick perfectly. So you have three lit three notes when you have the three notes perfectly and not just executed perfectly, but your brain has to be calm. And you'll find that, again, there's one note that no matter how well you've done the work beforehand, you hit that one note and all of the cards fall down, all the dominoes fall beforehand. And so use add a note and the pivot in conjunction with one another. And I think that you will see uh, kind of amazing results. And the final one, and this one I, I is taught very frequently by other teachers. I have to admit it hasn't worked that well for me. It's worked well uh, occasionally, and that's to change the rhythm. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba, or ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da in any in in given lick. Um, I guess I guess it just feels so uncomfortable. And I guess that's the idea, but I've never really been able to relate the improvement in the change of rhythm 
to the end product. It's not that I don't endorse it. It's just that it's something that hasn't worked for me. And I think knowing what works for you is a, is a key to practicing better. So that was session one is the skills, session two is the technique, and session three, my favorite, is performing. So I believe that performing requires two things, confidence and concentration. Now, Jeff talks a lot about this, and I, and I want to, like, it's amazing stuff. Jeff's, Jeff's teaching is incredible. Um, so I won't go over too much of the same things, but I will say that, that for me, the things that have resonated are, are is, the, is the fact that confidence is impossible without concentration, and concentration is impossible without confidence. So I believe that we need to work on those two concepts separately and together. So, so when you're working on your concentration, you are saying, what am I thinking at every given moment of a piece, of a solo, of a passage? And sometimes that's going to be, for me, it's going to be singing along or whisper, uh, whistle, whistling along um, in my head. Sometimes it's going to be just to, to concentrate on my, my fingers or on the note on the page, just trying to get my, my concentration zeroed in on what I'm doing. Now, the confidence aspect is about repeating successfully. I think that we can get into a, a habit of, of playing badly, playing wrong. And when I noticed this in my own practicing, when I more often than not in my practice room, I would screw things up. You want to talk about building myelin? Well, I felt like I was building habit towards playing things badly. And when I decided that I was only allowed to play things correctly, boy, did that change my practice room. So, so that changes the whole focus. That means that you can never play the concerto up to tempo until you can play every note well. Um, there's a teacher that Sarah's been introducing me to, uh, it's just escaping my mind right now, who says that you can't even practice a solo until you have it memorized. And boy, would that kick me in the butt. I basically never memorized anything because us horn players are not required to. Maybe we should be. But I would say that my version of that, because I, I really, at this age, can't really memorize anything. Um, I'm well known for playing the exposition of one Mozart concerto and the development of another one. Um, at this stage of my life, what it is uh, I've turned it into is I have to learn a piece before I play it. And that sounds obvious, but it's not. I feel like a lot of us learn while we're playing, but what if we were able to actually learn the intervals, learn the tempos, learn how we want to do it musically before we execute? So that's the concentration part. Uh, Jim Campbell, a, you know, a teaching mentor of mine, he doesn't even know that he's a teaching mentor of mine, but we've had a lot of conversations and I've, his teachings really impacted me uh, and a teacher at NYO, of course. He said he makes his studio play, uh, play things through nine times perfectly. If you can do anything nine times perfectly, you're ready. And that's a really valuable thing. Why nine, not 10? I, I think it's just a number you remember. Um, but really, I think, I think that it's really important to realize that if you can't repeat something successfully and correctly, then I think you're setting yourself for, for a, a less than great performance. You haven't built your confidence enough that you're actually able to do it before you put it in front of an audience. So a little bit more about this, about this session three. So this session three, this performance session, would be one where you decided on a passage um, beforehand. Let's say it's the exposition of a concerto. So you're going to play the exposition of a concerto, and you've worked everything out, and you're ready to perform it. So um, a couple of techniques I learned from uh, an amazing man who just passed away, I think, last year. His name was Michael Colgrass. Um, and he wrote a book called My Lessons with Kumi. Now, with great respect to Michael Corgrass, the book itself is just a little bit cheesy, but it's got like a ton of information in it. And in that book, he outlines how we basically how we visualize. And that's a kind of a scary word uh, to a lot of people, um, but it's not. Visualize, just picture, use your imagination. So um, a couple of techniques I'm going to give you. Uh, I'll put this in the document that I share with you later. Um, this one's been huge for me, the, the two-stand technique. I don't know if you have two stands at, at your houses, but maybe the piano and a stand, or maybe you just stand away from your stand, and, and you wait until you're ready to perform to approach the stand. So it's almost like walking on stage. This is really important, and this is something that I feel like we don't do enough, is that we create a performance environment in our practice rooms. 
And if you add recording to that experience, you will believe that you may not get the adrenaline rush of nerves, but you do get that kind of heightened sense of nervousness that you want to kind of live up to that recorder. So position your stand in a room. If you have two, that's amazing. I love it. I, I grab my music, go to the other stand, and that's my practice stand where I'm working something out. And then I go to the performance stand, put my music on the performance stand, or if you're memorized, you go to a spot. Uh, again, personal story, I was ridiculed roundly at NEC because I spent most of NEC with a yarn circle in my, like a piece of yarn in my pocket because what Colgrass said is, grab a piece of yarn and have a circle on the floor. It was a piece of red yarn. And when you're ready to perform, you step into that yarn circle. And it was so valuable for me. Listen, folks, grab some yarn, try it. You won't believe it. The, uh, the other one that Colgrass taught me that I, that I loved, I've got two more for you. One is that is use a visualization using an imaginary camera. So you can have three kind of cameras. One camera is coming out of your eyes. One camera is kind of up in the corner of a room. And one camera is an audience camera. And picture yourself walking to the stand, even if it's in your bedroom. Picture yourself walking to that stand from a camera angle. And get outside of yourself. It's just like listening in third person. So you're getting outside yourself. and and you're experiencing the performance from the outside rather than the inside. And I find that really valuable because, because of the, you know, the feeling of active listening, like I was talking about before being playing, like getting used to playing something badly. If you get, take yourself outside of your body, you'll be amazed at the things you could hear in your own playing. So there's one more little aspect to that. You perform from that camera angle, then you walk away from your stand and you rewind and play that performance back in your head. And if you do that successfully, you will not believe what you remember. I'm sure you've all had the experience of hearing something you've heard before and instantly remember where you were when you heard it. Um, and that's the same thing with, with playing. If, if you don't actively go back into that moment, you won't remember the mistakes you made and you won't be able to learn from them. So uh, that's visualization, building confidence. I think I'm doing pretty well at this session three. Oh, well, one thing I want to say is, is that Again, for people like me, my brain's going all over the place. Lighting is really important. I, um, a darkened practice room with a stand light is the way I swear to God I got a job. Um, because, and this is <coughs> before phones. So, so get your phone out of the equation, unless it's recording you. Uh, focus as much as you can. Using lighting has been very valuable for me and just bring your world between you and that music stand, even if the music stand is empty and you're, and you're, you're playing by memory. It's been a very important thing in my life. Three sessions, folks. First session or one session of the day is skills. The other one is call it technique, where you're, where you're working on specific challenges and you're playing. And the final one is performing. Now, lest you think that I'm going back on what I said before, these sessions do not have to be an hour long each. A performance session can be 15 minutes. A skill session can be 15 minutes. So let me get to timers. Timers, uh, relatively new in my life. 10 years is new for me. Um, so I mean, the timers are completely life-changing. So if you, if you have a trouble with too long prep sessions, and I know you might laugh at that, but, but some people just noodle for 40 minutes and don't get anything done. I call that a too long practice session. So if you force yourself to get all of that work done in 10 minutes, you won't believe the quality of your work and how it goes up. So the first way of, of, of using a timer is just throw on, a, you know, if you're working on that same exposition of a Mozart concerto, you throw on the timer for 12 minutes and you only have 12 minutes and you're done and you have discipline. Remember the discipline, what your future self wishes you had done is your future self wishes you had put down your instrument when you practice like crap, okay? So after that 12 minutes goes off, you put your instrument down and you walk away. And you ask yourself if you earned the right to come back. And if you have earned the right to come back, you come back and you can do it again. And if you haven't, you need to take a more extended time off the horn. So maybe take an hour off, go eat some lunch and come back and say, I've only got 12 minutes now, time to get to work. Uh, I just, I can't overstate how important that is. The other form of timer is the kind of five minutes, six minutes, four minutes, five minutes on, two minutes off. This one is also very valuable for focusing down the specific problems you're playing. Let's call it, I don't want to fake like I know about strings, so I'm going to stick to wins, uh, double tonguing. So 
So let's say you have a skill, and I'm sure scripting players, you can imagine a skill like that, which is kind of a specialty skill, but you still need to do it. If you don't do it, you don't have it. Spiccato is my guess. Um, so let's let's say you, you need to work on that. You throw a timer on for five minutes, and, and you know that timer is going to go off. And sometimes that's just like exercise. Sometimes that timer will feel like it's 20 minutes, and sometimes that timer will go by and feel like 30 seconds. But that um, kind of timer, when that dings, the discipline to put your instrument down. And at this point, it would be amazing to take notes. Um, I've been a terrible note taker throughout my life. It's only been in the past year or so that I've realized the value of it. And I just can't believe the value of looking back. I wish I'd learned this earlier. So this is me telling you, in that two minutes is a great time to take notes. It's also a great time to turn your brain off. This is a great time to check Facebook or whatever social media you're on, excuse me. It's also a great time to stick your head out, out a window and get some fresh air. Um, so in that two minutes, then you come back and I learned from this guy, is Pimsler is his name. He, he teaches, uh, there's a whole Pimsler course. It's like, um, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, the uh, language courses, Rosetta Stone. But Pimsler's idea is that you introduce a concept, you come back to it uh, very soon after you introduce a new concept. Let's say you work for five minutes on something, you move away from it, and then you come back and you get it both in short-term and long-term memory. So. Um, what I would encourage you to do is have to, uh, sorry, two or three skills or two or three things you're working on. Uh, for instance, it could be uh, one line of a, of a piece of music for five minutes, then move to a totally contrasting, maybe a second movement kind of thing, and then go back to the first problem and back to the second problem. So A, B, A, B, using the timer five minutes on, two minutes off. So that's less than half an hour, probably the best practicing you've done in two months. So that's the other way to use timers. Five minutes on, say two minutes off. The final way to use timers can raise your blood pressure a bit. So I don't want to add stress to your practice rooms. But this one, I have to admit, again, for me and my distracted brain, wowza. So I threw on a technical study or a technical problem and like a like a lick, like session two kind of practicing. And you throw the, the timer on 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off. And it can be a little bit uh, kind of like one of these, but but it also forces you to put your instrument down for 10 seconds every 30 seconds. And for me, it's almost just like a little recalibration. So I say, okay, wait, am I, is, is this good work? Is this work? Or beep, you're like, okay, now I'm gonna get back to good work. Uh, I've never learned an etude faster than the 30 seconds, 10 seconds. I mean, I have to admit, I was, you know, but I've gotten used to it since then. So um, three ways to use a timer, the 20 minute timer, uh, and then just put the instrument down, and walk away, ask yourself if you earned, earned the right to come back. The five minute timer times three, five minutes on, two minutes off times three using contrasting problems. And then the 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off for like specific skill learning, three kinds of play. So I've been talking a long time. I, I wanna wrap up by, by maybe echoing what Andrew, I, I wasn't able to make Andrew's um, Andrew's talk, but I'm just thinking about my students here and thinking about what I can't do and how grateful I am that I don't rely on freelance work from, from my income. So, um, you know, it's possible in a city like Toronto or Montreal or lots of other cities in Canada to uh, make a good living as a freelancer. Um, but very often you will be so busy you're turning down three gigs and all the gigs will line up on the same day. And then sometimes you won't be working for a month. And in this situation, nobody's got their back. And hopefully, uh, hopefully I mean, the government has a little bit, so that's helped. But I'm thinking, you know, and if, if orchestras are off for a while, what skills do I wish I had? Well, I don't play piano. And if I need to go and teach in a high school or something, and it's not really to just French horn players, it would be really great if I had the ability to just like, a company on the piano, it would be amazing. Thankfully I sing. Can you sing? Can you play the piano? Can you play the guitar? Can you arrange? Now here's where I'm getting this. So I think that if you have time and it, if, if it's a joyful, creative thing, I don't think it should be like, I don't think it should be stressful or bad. Like, but what if it's fun to learn piano? What if it's fun to learn guitar? What if it's fun to learn how to sing? I would really encourage it during this time. The skills of a musician, I feel like, uh, post COVID-19 will include arranging and I feel like it'll include sound editing and I feel like it include uh, video editing. So if you have um, access to a decent computer, um, I think this, the trials are still going on right now, Final Cut Pro and the Adobe version. 
um, of film editing. Just get your chops going in film editing because in this time between the end of COVID-19 and audition starting again, there might be a while, it might be a year. And for those of you that are reaching the end of your degrees, it would be really great for you to have these skills. I'm on the inside right now of the TSO um, and what we're trying to do, and we are desperate for video editors. So um, as a way to supplement uh, your time now, um, I would consider leveling up on those things. Um, I, I like to read and, and, and study investing, and um, I was looking at some uh, YouTube video the other day, and somebody asked uh, Warren Buffett what is what his uh, greatest uh, advice for um, investors to avoid risk, and he says, "Get your skills better." And I thought, "Wow, that's certainly true for musicians too." If we, I, I mean, I'm very optimistic about our business in the future, but I think it's going to take some time. So during that time, level up your skills so that you can, uh, so that you can be the kind of person that people want to hire. So I do want to leave leave you guys on a positive note. Um, our and I, I I truly believe this, um, and I don't want to get cheesy, but I really believe that there is a lot of value in what we do. I believe that uh, that it's not a coincidence that music has been around since the dawn of humanity, and I believe that as kind of Western classical musicians, we can. Uh, help lead the musical voice of our communities. And so um, I believe that a job in a symphony orchestra and a job as a musician um, is an important one. And so, uh, you know, chin up. Uh, performance is a stop for now. That won't be forever. Um, and maybe you guys will be part of the solution to get this uh, business roaring again and even better than it was. So I think I'll leave it there. I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, I love when people disagree with me. It's 2.47, we got some time. Anybody have any questions? Okay, Gabe, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I personally really enjoyed the add a note and pivot idea but above all, it's all the inspiration that you have supplied with us. So thank you again, Gabe, for, for being here with us today. My, my pleasure, Chris. All right. Take care. Thank you.